So in lecture 16, on Wednesday, we had a, a brief overview of the nervous system as we start into it. You had, uh, we looked at nerves, tracts, ganglions, nuclei. And now we're going to be starting um, the anatomy of the spinal cord and spinal nerves on a gross scale, so not microscopic, but just um, anatomically. And a lot of what you're learning today, in two weeks in lab, you'll be able to see it. And so again, just like you've done with the muscles, learn it in the uh, on the paper first, and then match it up with the, with the donors. Same thing with, with the nervous system. So spinal cord and spinal nerves. Um, this is our, our frontal view of the brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord's uh, been severed there just in order to fit the whole thing on the page. And so we already know this is the central nervous system. So today's lecture, as we look at the spinal cord and spinal nerves, just keep in mind we're looking at CNS, part of the CNS, as well as part of the peripheral nervous system. Topics, we'll go coverings over the um, central nervous system, spinal cord, the external view of that, and then cross-sectionally, what does that look like? Talk a little bit about spinal nerves and then finish up with dermatomes. So the covering over the CNS. I think it's easiest to study the meninges as the covering over the brain, but these are the, um, membranes that extend all the way down. So we'll look at them over the brain, but just keep in mind that they'll go all the way down. We'll see some pictures of that a little bit later. So the meninges, you're going to have three layers. The pia mater, the soft mother. The arachnoid mater, uh, mater the um, spider or spider web mater. And then the dura mater, the tough mother. And then, of course, you have that skull over the top. So we'll have the brain and then these different um, layers as protective layers. We'll also have the cerebral spinal fluid helping to buoy the brain and protect the brain. And then we have the skull over the brain as well. So the brain's well protected um, within these structures. So if we put those back on the board, the, the meninges, the three layers of the meninges, notice that there are spaces in between them. So if we're looking at the dura mater, and then we say, what is the space up on or outside um, of the dura mater? And then you have the epidural space. So the epidural. Beneath the dura, or deep to the dura, the subdural space. And then deep to the arachnoid mater, you can kind of see the spider web-ish type of arachnoid mater. Deep to that is going to be the subarachnoid space. Key thing, and we'll keep emphasizing this throughout the lecture, just as a framework, one of those hooks to keep in mind, the subarachnoid space is where the CSF lives. Also notice on here, potential spaces. So potential spaces are spaces that normally there is no room between them. But you could put something in there. So these could fill up with, say, blood. You could bleed into these. But typically, these um, layers are juxtaposed to each other. So if we were to draw this a little bit differently, we may do it more like this. In this picture, what is this space? Yeah, subarachnoid space. What lives there? Your, yeah, your CSF. Notice here in the epidural and the subdural space are potential spaces. They're not really there. In fact, just this past week in the dissection group, as we were um, cutting off the, the, the skull and then um, revealing back the skull to get to the brain, what you'll see is this dura mater is super um, adhered to the skull. If you're kind of peeling it back, um, there, there really is no, no true space there. Except, again, if you bleed into it, you can get an um, epidural or a subdural hematoma. So that was the coverings. Let's look now at the spinal cord. So the brain's here. Here's the spinal cord. These sections are going to be the same sections as we saw with the, uh, with the vertebrae. So you have the, spinal, uh, the cer um, cervical section here, the thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and a little bit of coccygeal. Notice in this picture that this is an enlargement of the spinal cord. How big do you think the spinal cord is? Like just show me with your, with your hands. Give me a, a dimension. Yeah, and it's usually a lot smaller than folks will, will think, and I'll show you here in just a second. But it's also not completely cylindrical all the way down. There are some areas that are um, like enlargements. So you'll see one over the cervical region, and we'll call it the cervical enlargement. And then down here in the lumbar sacral, and it's the lumbosacral enlargement. So some terminology that will come up again in the lab. 
what we were looking there is from a directly posterior view. If we look at a lateral view, and so then you have the curvatures of the spine. In this picture, particularly what I want you to notice is you have the segments of the spinal cord that we just looked through. But notice how those line up or don't line up directly with the um, vertebral column. So when we were studying the bones, we had these seven cervical vertebrae, these 12 thoracic vertebrae, the lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. Notice where the cord actually stops. The spinal cord comes down, but the end of the cord is about L1. So the level of the cord, the spinal cord, stops much um, earlier than the rest of the vertebral column. In an upcoming lecture, we'll talk a little bit about spinal taps. In spinal taps, you'll know that the cord ends about L1, so you'll come down at about L3, L4, L5 to actually put your needle in to test some of the cerebral spinal fluid. So you're well below the level of the cord. You'll also notice that there's this line that's extending from the cord. And that line is the phylum terminale. It's actually the, the pia mater, the soft mother, that extends down and then anchors the cord um, down here in the, in the coccyx. The pia mater is it's a soft mother. It's so tightly adhered to the brain and to the um, cord that you cannot pull it off. So that's going to... This, the phylum terminale is the term we call it, but it's the extension of the pia mater all the way down that anchors the cord down there. And you'll, you'll see that in lab. So I'm going to show you a couple um, cadaveric pictures um, of the brain and then spinal cord. So here's your brain. The spinal cord, as it's coming down, you can start to get a sense of it, a, a, a sense of the size. If we just put it out, put it on the table, it may look something like this. And we do have some models that look um, similar to this. And so here is the cord. You'll notice even here a bit of the cervical enlargement. Come down here, and you'll have a lumbar sacral enlargement. And you'll have the spinal nerves coming off. Notice here, because this comes back um, later in the lecture, notice the nerves coming here. They're almost coming off in a braided fashion. And those braided fashions are, are called plexuses. So we'll have the cervical plexus and a brachial plexus, a lumbar and a sacral plexus. And it's just that braiding of the nerves as the nerves are coming off the spinal cord. So here's the picture of them. We have, um, again, several models that you'll see in, in lab in a couple of weeks. So I won't pass this around today. But here is the, one of the um, spinal cords, just, just plain. And so you can see about the size. We'll look in an upcoming picture. We'll look at the cross section and identify some things. You can see some of the rootlets and then spinal roots coming off, and those will come together to form a spinal nerve that we'll talk about late, um, later. When you have a chance to look at it more closely, you'll see the cervical enlargement. And then on this one, it's not quite as easy to see, but you'll have a lumbar sacral enlargement as well. Question? So how old was the person about? Did that look knocked up? A uh, couple things. So the question is, how, how old was the, was the person? These are adults. So all of our donors have been, have been full-grown adults, and you have different sizes of them. But keep in mind that we cut it. This is of the sub, um, spinal cords. So there's still a little bit more here um, connected to the brain in the brain stem. And also, this is the length of the spinal cord. The nerves that continue to extend down from here, they'll go to the legs. That'll make it a lot longer. But this will stop at about L1. So that's about what you're seeing here. So from the top to the, um, to the bottom. So you'll see that then in, in lab. Some of the donors that we have in lab, um, we've, we've left the spinal cord still in situ, so they're still in the body. And so you'll see kind of how that, how that matches up. So here's a blown up picture of the cadaveric um, specimen. Here's your phylum terminale coming on down here. The end of the cord, we already said it ends at about L1-ish, lumbar um, region 1. It actually tapers off. And you can see that cone-shaped tapering there. And it's called the conus medullaris. So it's that end of the cord as it tapers off. And then the phylum terminale is that the pia mater that extends down from there, anchors down to the coccyx. Sometimes it's called the coccygeal ligament because of that. But phylum terminale might be your more common, common term. And then I don't know if you can tell from where you're sitting there, but there's um, a bunch of spinal nerves that continue down. 
And these are going down then to the lower extremities, going down to the thighs and legs. The bunch of spinal nerves as they're going down tends to look like a tail of the horse. And so that's what we call it, the tail of the horse, cauda equina. I'll take away the words again just so you can see the picture and then I'll put the words back up. But hopefully you can appreciate this, this conus medullaris. You, you have to see it, you have to know what you're looking for to see that cone shape. But the same thing in lab. When you get to lab, you'll have to look for it to see, oh yeah, I can see the, the cord, the thickness of the cord actually narrowing. And then that phylum terminale. The phylum terminale is going to look very much like some of these other um, nerves, the spinal nerves coming off. But you'll be able to track this phylum terminale back to the cord itself. So as you're in lab, just pay attention, pay attention to that. So there's where those were labeled. So back to our picture, we looked at the cord and then all these spinal nerves coming down, going down to the lower extremity. Here's another picture of that, that cauda equina, the tail of the horse, and that's over there in our picture. Again, the, the cord you can see is ending at about L1. And reference back to the spinal tap or the lumbar puncture, you'll use the iliac crest as your landmark for going in with the needle so you're well below the level of the cord when you go in with the needle to get that cerebral spinal fluid to send it to the lab. Questions there? Yes? So we've looked at the coverings over the spinal, um, the spinal cord the spinal cord, the external. Let's now look at a cross section of it. And to do this, let's think first about drawing a house. You don't have to draw it, just in your mind as we're, as we're up here, um, you, can, you can draw it. So in your, in your mind's eye with a house, have the front door, a back door, sidewalks, and people. And here's the rule. Folks have to use the back door to get into the house and the front door to get out of the house. So, if we had our house, it's a real house. Here's your front door, here's your back door, and here's your sidewalk. If we put the direction of the people, the people have to get into this house through the back door. They can go upstairs and they can come downstairs, but they're going to exit the house through the front door. You see that? So. When we went upstairs and downstairs, we called these ascending tracks and descending tracks. Do you remember from last time, what's a track? Yeah, a bundle of axons in the central nervous system. The nerve is a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. So this, the sidewalk over here is going to be our spinal nerve. And it's as it's going to come into the spinal cord. And as the axons travel up, there's going to be ascending tracks. And down, it's going to be descending tracks. Notice on, on the spinal nerve, you have information going both ways. You have people going both ways. But they're going to come in the back door. So we're going to call that back door, um, the, the sidewalk leading to the back will be the dorsal root. And then in the front will be the ventral root. Sometimes you'll hear these as posterior roots and anterior roots, but more commonly dorsal roots and ventral roots. You'll also have a collection of soma back here in the dorsal root. With, from last, um, last lecture, what is a collection of soma in the peripheral nervous system called? Ganglion, ganglion. yeah. So this is our dor um, dorsal root ganglion. Again, this is still peripheral nervous system. It's not central nervous system until you actually get to the cord. Remember as well how we said same Dave? Remember how we had um, the same sensory as afferent, motor as efferent? Dave, dorsal is afferent, ventral is efferent. So information, sensory information is coming in the back door, motor information is coming out that front door. Afferent information in the back door, efferent in the front door. So there's another house plan, and there's our sidewalks. So take a look at this picture. And these are all of the, the terms that we have used, except the rootlets 
are little roots, and you'll see that in an upcoming picture. So they're going to um, end up with little rootlets. Here you'll have the ventral rootlets that will merge to form the ventral root. So you're good with this picture here. If we were to use that as a sketch quiz, could you get that? It's pretty basic. Can you get that as a sketch quiz? The other thing to notice here, um, it was in the last lecture. We didn't talk about it specifically. But in the spinal cord, cross-section of the spinal cord, you have this gray H in snow. I just remember it as a gray H in snow. So the, the gray matter is in the interior part of the central uh, of the spinal cord. The white matter is on the outside. That's opposite of the brain. In the brain, you're going to have the gray matter as the cortex, and the white matter is going to be deeper. So the gray H in snow we'll refer to, and that is these, um, and th these horns right here that we'll talk about in a second. Spinal nerves. If we go to the right a little bit further, the, you have dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. So the dorsal ramus, again, that information, um, the blue is our afferent, so blue is going to come in. Um, red is our motor, motor is going to go out. But notice how the dorsal ramus can have both um, motor and sensory, same with our ventral ramus. And then over here, our horns, you have the dorsal horns and the ventral horns of the cord itself. So again, just terminology, just um, vocab as we're doing it. Again, we don't have this as a sketch quiz, but this would be a good one to be, make sure you can, can draw out and um, talk through. So here's our picture cross-section. We have our um, information going in, the sidewalk on the back, the sidewalk in the front. We have our spinal nerve. So here's our spinal nerve. What's that? How, how would you label it? What was that? Yeah, here's our ventral root. So what's that? Ventral rootlet. It's a little bit harder to see there, but just see how there's a bunch of little rootlets there? So our ventral rootlet. So what's that back there? Dorsal root, dorsal rootlet, and dorsal root ganglion. So you're going to have a bunch of somas back there. Remember what that was from the slide before? Dorsal horn, nice, and then the ventral horn. Yep, and this is our gray H in snow. So here's the picture we're looking at. Here we have the vertebral body. The vertebra here is the actual spinal cord. You have the dura mater around there. So we'll blow this picture up and look at it a little bit. What is that space? That's your subarachnoid space. What lives there? CSF. Yep. So if this is your cord, what are these things coming off of it? What is this one? Ventral root, dorsal root. What's this? Yeah, that's your spinal nerve that are going to branch then into the rami. You see that? What are those? Okay, so they are arteries. That's blood. Keeping in mind that this is the transverse foramina. So what, what level are we in? We're the, yeah, we're the cervical, um, the cervical region of the vertebrae. And the vessels that come through that transverse foramina, do you remember? Vertebral arteries, yeah, I heard it. Good job. So those are your are vertebral arteries. So for which level of the spinal cord is this? It's the cervical region. So here's a schematic. Take a look at that, and then we'll continue on. We'll see a picture like this very, very shortly. Questions at this point? Back to the um, slide that you were on before. Mm -hmm. Where's the gray H? Just ah, sometimes you can see it. Sometimes it's not as clear. In fact, I'm wondering in this specimen, do we see it? Sometimes in lab that we can see it. Sometimes you, you can see a hint of it here. Um, also in certain stainings, when they um, take a cross section and put it under the slide, you can see it a lot easier. But yeah, um, usually there's just a, um, a bit of difference when you look, especially of the brains as we, as we cut the brains. And when we get into the brain anatomy, the brain can be really tough, and especially depending the, the view, because it looks different in all these different views. But there's a few views that you'll see that you can really see gray versus white matter a lot better. Yeah, this, this picture, I agree, you can't see too much, but good question. Here's a picture we saw last time. And at that point, we were looking at these types of nerves, the, uh, the, the types of, excuse me, neurons, so the unipolar, bipolar, multipolar. But we said here is that cross-section of the spinal cord that we'll get to later, now is later. So here's that cross-section. Notice how the afferent um, neuron came in the back door. 
the motor neuron and the axon there came out the front door. This is our spinal nerve. And this, this swelling there where you see the soma, that's your dorsal root ganglion. Also a note right here, this is the frontal view of the brain, and we'll be looking at that in an upcoming lecture. Because of where the information is coming from, where it's going, we know that this is actually in the cervical um, region, and, and we'll get to that a little bit more when we talk about um, which nerves are coming from which part of the brain to supply which muscles. Okay, so here's another, another cross-sectional picture. A few more um, vocab terms. You have the front of the spinal cord, and notice how this, the front of the spinal cord, there's a gap, this fissure, it's a deep fissure, and it's in the middle. So it's an anterior median fissure, as opposed to the back, there's a, a deep divide, but it's not as deep, it's a sulcus. When we are studying the brain, and, um, even from what you already know about the brain, you know how there's mountain ridges and valleys. The mountain ridges are going to be our gyri, the valleys are going to be our sulci, but a deep valley will be a fissure. So we have the same thing on the spinal cord. The front here, the deep valley will be our fissure, and the um, shallow, more, uh, more shallow uh, valley will be a sulcus. So posterior median sulcus, anterior median fissure, and then you have a hole in the middle, that central canal. Next um, lecture, on Monday, when we start talking about the cerebral spinal fluid and how it flows, we'll see that this, not only does the um, cerebral spinal fluid flow around in the subarachnoid space, but it also comes through the central canal. If we matched it up over here with our drawing, it would be this. And again, that space is the subarachnoid space. The CSF lives in the subarachnoid space. So let's go through number one. What are you going to label it? Yeah, posterior median sulcus. Number number two. Central canal three. Anterior median fissure. So it's always deeper in the front. The fissures in the front. The sulcus is in the back. Um, now the spinal meninges. You have the um, the innermost layer again. It's so tightly adhered you can't pull it off. What one's that? Pia mater. Number five is. Arachnoid mater, and then six is dura mater. What you'll actually see in the, um, when, you, when you look at the lab, the dura mater is going to come and extend over um, some of the, um, the um, roots here. So you'll see that dura mater actually extending out through. You don't see that in this cartoon drawing. Number seven, it's a potential space, but what are you going to call the space deep to the dura mater? Subdural. Yep, subdural space. What about number eight? Subarachnoid, what lives there? Yeah, good. Um, number nine. Number nine are denticulate ligaments. And just as you have the coccygeal ligament or the phylum terminale securing the cord post, uh, in a vertical direction, securing it down here, these denticular, denticulate ligaments will secure it side to side. So you have a number of things in place trying to hold the spinal cord firm. And then you have this fluid around it that also helps to buffer it. Number 10, what are you going to call that? Spinal. Yeah, it's a spinal nerve because the roots are, are here. These are the rootlets. The roots where they join together, that's your spinal nerve. Dorsal root ganglion, you can see here in the, in the back. Good. We know that this is the posterior side because we see the posterior median sulcus. So based on that, what are the, what's this going to be called? Yeah, those are still the rootlets, because you see several of them. So the posterior rootlets of the spinal, um, spinal nerve, and then they're going to they join up to be the posterior roots, which will join to the anterior roots to form your, your spinal nerve. Here, remember what those are? That's the denticulate ligament, yeah, good. What is this one? Do you know? That's the dura mater, yeah. So you have the dura mater. The dura mater and the arachnoid mater are super um, closely adhered. So in the lab, when you pull back the dura mater, you're uh, also pulling back the arachnoid mater, and you're looking where the CSF would be living. So again, there's a potential space between these, but typically there, there's no space. They go right up next to each other.
So as the cross section, let's look at some spinal nerves. We've seen some of this terminology before when we were talking about the muscles. So we, uh, the whole thing is the nerve, and we already know that an, a nerve, we've called it a bundle of axons in the peripheral nervous system. But these are wrapped, and so you have the endoneurium. Instead of the endomesium, you have endoneurium. So that's around the individual axon. And then the perineurium and the epineurium. So um, vocab that we've seen before, it's not terribly critical, but since you, you're already familiar with it, you might as well learn it. And so if you see that, you're not surprised. But then you have the whole the spinal nerve. Central nervous system, so brain and spinal cord. This is a concept that's super easy once you get it, but some people were confused with it. So let me just make sure it's clear. The central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. Then both the brain and the spinal cord have nerves coming off of them. If, they, if the nerves come off the spinal cord, they're spinal nerves. If the nerves come off the brain, what are they called? Cranial, cranial nerves, yeah. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and we'll spend a whole lecture looking at those. But for this lecture, we'll do the spinal nerves. So these are nerves coming off the spinal cord. Some of these nerves are going to be involved with a bit of a braiding, and there's four areas along the spinal cord that as the nerves come off, they're braided or in these plexuses. And so we'll look, we'll look at those. So 31 pairs of nerves that come off the spinal cord. These are spinal nerves. We'll look at how the spinal nerves are numbered and then the nerve plexus. So if this is our brain stem, here are the bodies of the um, vertebrae. C1, the nerve for C1 is going to come out above C1, and then C2, and so it numbers out all the way down. Notice C8. You have a nerve C8, but you don't have a vertebrae C8, a vertebra. So that's a little bit unique. After that, then, you'll, uh, all of the nerves will come out from under their respective vertebral body. So it would have all worked well, except we have a nerve coming out above C1. So we named that C1, and it threw that whole cervical region off. And so we added a C8, and then everything else comes off beneath. Let's focus in on this region right here. So it's C5 through T1 right here. So C5 through T1, these are the nerve roots of of C1 through, through um, C5 through T1. So you have these rootlets, uh, excuse me, these roots coming off. And then this is one of our examples of this braiding, this plexus. And as it comes off, these terms are actually very specific. So you have roots, and then trunks, divisions, and cords. In this class, we're not going to look super closely at the names of the divisions or the names of the cords, but I just want you to know the segments and in the sections that those occur. So you have roots, trunks, divisions, and cords. And then out here, you're going to have terminal nerves. Sometimes they call these terminal nerves branches. So these actually mean something specific. You can't just interchange them. It, it's in a, in a certain way. So if you need a mnemonic, some people have suggested, as you're holding out a cup of coffee, and you're holding it out because you're using part of the brachial plexus nerves to hold it out. So the, the mnemonic is really tired, need, uh, drink coffee. So really tired, drink coffee. So if that's helpful to you, feel free to, um, to use that. It takes about as long to remember the mnemonic as just to remember the roots, trunks, divisions, and cords, but that may be helpful. And then we'll have another mnemonic for the terminal nerves, also known as branches. And you may recognize some of these nerves. These are a little bit more familiar to us. So musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar. As we continue in with our muscles study and look at the origin, insertion, action, and innervation, some of these nerves will, will come up. So if you need a mnemonic for the terminal nerves, some have suggested this. My aunt remarried my uncle. So my aunt remarried my uncle. There is one caveat to that that I would mention. And that is in this type of picture, as you look through, and this is a great helpful schematic, but notice how my aunt, and you're like, wait, where's the M? Because I see axial, uh, axillary nerve first. So you have to make sure you're um, right 
uh, in, in the direct place to make sure it will fit. So it's my aunt remarried my uncle. So again, if that's a helpful one to you, you're welcome to. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking specifically in the plexus. And so as you learn, let me get back to this picture. As you learn more detail about these trunks and divisions, certain uh, portions of them will either um, bifurcate or will combine. And then you'll see that that's the, what we call the division between them. Anatomically, there's not except where, uh, where they come together. So think of a highway. And sometimes they change names. They say, oh, well, where two roads come together, then that changes names. And that's also then going to be like between a trunk and a division. So typically in grad school, um, you'll get to the place where you'll have to draw out the brachial plexus and um, label each one of those trunks or divisions. And there's uh, and know which fibers, for instance, in this cord, where do the fibers come from? Which levels over here specifically come to here? And so we're not going to get to that uh, in here, but I at least want you to be familiar um, with the, the major divisions as well as the, those terminal nerves. This is also helpful when we dissect, because you can anticipate where the nerve should be and then go look for it in that area. So take a look at these injuries. And the question is, which body part is injured from any of these activities? And the act, yeah, the answer is your brachial plexus. Question. Can you clarify the roots of the trunks and divisions of the ribs? Does it only apply to the brachial plexus? That it applies to all of them? You know what? That's a good question. I've only seen it in terms of the brachial plexus, but it wouldn't surprise me if it, if it applies to the others. Yeah, yeah, great question. So these are brachial plexus injuries. Sometimes the injury is just kind of categorized as that. And in each one of these, you can see where the injuries, so maybe they're here at the rootlet versus out here at one of the other divisions. And so these are significant injuries. You'll see them, to, um, you'll see them in adults, but the other place you'll see it is with um, shoulder dystocia. We've mentioned shoulder dystocia, I think, in here at least one time before, but it's where the shoulders of the baby get caught as it's trying to be delivered, and you can press down on this shoulder so the shoulder gets stuck. And then you can end up with a um, uh, brachial plexus injury of a, of a newborn. So nerve plexuses, cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral. Again, back to this picture. We're looking at the posterior view. And anywhere you see some of this braiding is where these plexuses are. I'm going to highlight on each of these areas at least one nerve that I really want you to learn from that plexus. So from the cervical plexus, the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve is going to come from or involve roots of C3, 4, and 5. So in through here. So when you, when you see cervical plexus, you can see all on this on particular side, lots of other nerves listed. We're going to pay attention to the phrenic nerve. Do you know anything about the phrenic nerve? Phrenic nerve is C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. That one's going to come all the way down and innervate the diaphragm. So in a spinal cord injury, if the spinal cord injury is above the, the level of C3, 4, and 5, the phrenic nerve isn't going to fire, the diaphragm isn't going to work, that patient can't breathe on their own. So they're going to be on a ventilator. From the brachial plexus, you know these terminal nerves. Do you remember what they are? What's that M? First, the mnemonic. My aunt remarried my uncle. If that helps, you can, you can um, use that one. But what was the M? Musculocutaneous, good. Um, the, the A? axillary, the R, radial, median, medial, and ulnar. Yep, yep, nice. Lumbar, and the lumbar plexus, the one nerve I want you to, to remember is the femoral nerve. And it's the one in lab, um, even on Tuesday, several of you saw it, the, the femoral nerve, we were looking at the femoral artery um, vein and nerve coming down. It's a pretty large nerve. You'll pay more attention to it um, when we're studying nerves versus just looking at the muscles. But the femoral nerve is going to come out of the lumbar, um, lumbar plexus, which is in the anterior, sacral plexus coming out from behind 
You'll see that next week when we do posterior muscles on the donor. But this is going to be our um, sciatic nerve. So that's the big one. We talked about the sciatic nerve, but we haven't seen it yet in the donor. You'll see that tomorrow. But these are coming from these plexuses. Question? Before we circle, does it matter if it's a single incomplete or complete uh, severed uh, spinal cord before the diaphragm? Yeah, so the question is, so some, for some of these nerves to be paralyzed, does it matter if it's a complete um, severance of the, of the spinal cord or, or only a portion? portion. And there's a number of things that go into that. You can have it severed. You can also have just inflammation around that area that's gonna in, um, going to influence how well action potentials are sent. So yeah, so there's, there's a lot that will go into, into that. Cervical plexus, C3 and 4 and 5, the phrenic nerve, keeps the diaphragm alive. Here is that phrenic nerve. You can see it coming from the plexus up here all the way down. Um, usually in the cadavers, we see these as they um, track right around along the heart and then they'll innervate the diaphragm. Brachial plexus, the five terminal nerves, and we've talked through, through some of those. And clinically, you'll see brachial plexus injuries. The lumbar plexus, here's our femoral nerve. And then, there it is again, so anterior portion of the body. Inguinal ligament, take a look here. What is this muscle? Sartorius, yeah. What are, um, what are these groups of muscles? The quadricep, what's that one in particular? Rectus femoris. Hey, what's this one? Pectineus, nice job. Yeah, these are each in, um, innervated by the femoral nerve. So as that femoral nerve is gonna come right through here, right through here, it's gonna send branches to each one of those. And so knowing the location of the nerves and the no location of, of the muscles is helpful as you're trying to learn innervations. Um, sacral plexus, this is that sciatic nerve that we've talked a bit about. What's the muscle that coming across here that sciatic nerve typically, 90% of the time, passes under? Piriformis, yeah, nice job. And then irritation of that can get that classic sciatica or sciatic pain. You can also um, get injury of these nerves. So here's as the spinal nerve's coming out. Remember the disc, do you remember the two portions of the disc? Mm -hmm. Nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus, yeah. So what's the disc herniation? It's where something's sticking its nose where it doesn't belong. So you have the nucleus pulposus breaking through, so a little weakness of the annulus fibrosus it, um, that, that caused a tear and the nucleus pulposus herniates through, puts pressure on the spinal nerve that's going down. And that's a common cause for sciatic pain, but as we talked in lab, you can have other causes for sciatic pain as well. So our last topic is dermatomes, derm means skin. And so on this one, we're going to say which areas of skin are associated with each of the spinal nerves. So here's the picture that, that is um, a classic picture of these dermatomes. And so if you had a spider land on your shoulder, you can say, so which spinal nerve is going to carry that information to our brain? And so this is a map of that. So if we're talking about the shoulder, we're talking about this is area C5. So it would be the C5 spinal nerve. It's going to bring that information to. It's going to come in the back door of the spinal cord because it's sensory. It's going to go up to the, to the brain, be processed. And then if you need to swat it, then it'll send that, the motor information out the front door. So the dermatomes is just a map of um, spinal nerves, which of, which of the areas of skin are innervated by these spinal nerves. I find it a little bit confusing. Like, why are there some that are at a diagonal, some are, at, are, are more um, side to side? So I have found this picture to be more helpful because all of a sudden then it's, it's lined up more organized in my mind. So if that's a helpful um, picture to you or helpful at least explaining some of it, you can use it. So clinically, you don't have to memorize all of those dermatomes, but there are some that are going to be helpful. So read the following out loud. Ready? C4 is neck or necklace. Because sometimes if you think neck, you might think up here. And C4 is more where you might wear a necklace, so a little bit lower. So C4. We're going to be looking at C4, T4, L4, and S4. 
So C4 is neck. Next one. T4 is nipples. L4 is your knee. I know it has a K, but for our purposes it doesn't. And then S4 is the anus. So when we look back at our picture, C4, T4, L4, and S4. So these are just reference points. If you know those clinically, you can always look them up. But if you know them clinically, when you're seeing a patient, you, um, can I borrow you just for a second? You can stay right there. So a patient may be, be laying down, maybe has a spinal cord injury of some sort. And I can say, can you feel this? So I'll, I'll touch them here. Can you feel this? Normally, actually, you would start lower. You'd say, okay, can, I, can you feel this as I touch his leg? And he says, yes. So then I keep working my way up. Can you feel this? Now, can you feel this? Can you feel this? And so you're, where on the skin can they start having feeling? And so you may say, oh, he can feel, he can't feel right here, but when I get up to the shoulders, he can feel. So C5 is intact, but T1 isn't. Does that make sense? So clinically, these dermatones are helpful. Again, if you just have a few reference points. The other reference point that's really helpful is T10. It's the belly button. So on our drawing, it, it looks like it's T9. This is a good reminder that these are all um, general. They kind of overlap a little bit. So it's not a super specific science of, from person to person, but it gives you, it gives you the idea. Oftentimes, after a spinal cord injury, you have the injury, but you also have a lot of inflammation, and so a lot of swelling. And so as that swelling is coming down, the, um, you're, you continually assess them. So this is helpful with that. Also, note that C1 has no dermatome. All the others have the skin associations, but C1 does not. No, C2 is all the way on the, on the head there. I'm going to play a quick video. Um, this is, again, the clinical um, correlation to this. And we'll, we'll end with this video. Hi, I'm Marcy from BrainSpinalCord.org. Today I'll be bringing you some information on the levels of function in spinal cord injury. Be sure to check the website for all relevant links and recaps of this article. If you or a loved one has sustained a spinal cord injury, you've most likely heard the doctor or medical team classify the injury with a letter or number, such as C4 or T2. What do those letters and numbers mean? These letters and numbers refer to the levels of function a spinal cord injury survivor has after the injury. Before I get into the specific levels of function, I'd like to go over how the human spinal cord works, as well as the impact of spinal cord injuries. The human spinal cord acts as the conduit between the brain and the rest of the body, relaying messages. When the spinal cord is bruised, crushed, or torn, the messages sent between the brain and the body no longer flow through the damaged area of the spinal cord. What does this mean? It means that the functions of the body located above the point of injury will continue to operate normally, while the functions below the point of injury will suffer some degree of impairment, including motor deficit, sensory deficit, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and respiratory difficulties. The letters and numbers that doctors refer to after a spinal cord injury are used to identify where along the spinal cord the injury occurred. The higher the point of injury, the greater the impairment. C-level injuries occur in the cervical area of the spine. An injury that occurs in the C1 to C3 area results in limited movement of the head and neck only, with paralysis below that region. In many cases, the survivors of C1 to C3 injuries have difficulty talking and require the use of a ventilator to breathe. Survivors with C3 to C4 injuries have head and neck movement, as well as some limited shoulder movement. They're typically able to talk and can eventually adjust to breathing without a ventilator. Those with C5 level injuries generally have head, neck, and shoulder control and can bend the elbows and rotate their hands. At this level, self-care is manageable. Survivors with this level of injury can often push their wheelchair and driving is frequently possible with adaptive equipment. A C6 level injury results in movement of the head, neck, shoulders, arms, and wrists, including the ability to bend the elbows, extend the wrists, and rotate the palms. The population who falls into this category is generally able to perform most self-care duties, can perform light housekeeping, and can manage a manual wheelchair. Those with C7 injuries have similar abilities as those with C6 injuries, but can manage more easily. 
Injuries that occur at the T level of the spinal cord occur in the thoracic region of the spine. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with a C8 to T1 level injury, in addition to the use of the head, neck, shoulders, arms, and hands, the fingers will also be able to be used. Survivors with injuries in this range are generally able to live independently. Survivors with T2 to T6 have normal function in the upper body but have some degree of impairment in the legs. Some can walk with assistive devices, and those with T7 to T12 level injuries have similar function with slightly more control. L level injuries occur in the lumbar region of the spine, and survivors generally have some ability to move the hips and knees. With this type of injury, walking is often possible with assistive devices. This concludes our segment on the level of function of spinal cord injury. Remember to check our website for the most up-to-date information, including resources and tips regarding so you will see patients um, with spinal cord injuries and it's just amazing that if you have, when you think of the spinal cord, just the difference between this level and half an inch lower really changes what the, they're able to do without assistance. So continue to, to study this on paper when we get to the lab, um, then it'll be easier to, to match it up. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday.